Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Amelia Salter. I am the Director of Programs here at the Chicagoland Chamber. We certainly appreciate you spending your lunch hour and afternoon with us for today's program, How Startups Can Fuel Your Corporate Innovation. Um, we're really excited for today um, because it builds on a lot of what the Chamber is trying to do, which is build connectivity between businesses within the Chicagoland business community. Um, and today's a great example of how we're doing that. So we've partnered um, with our technology council and Startup Chicago um, to put on today's program. And you're gonna hear a little bit more from them momentarily. Um, the Chambers Tech Council, and I know we have many tech council members on today, um, is a group of business and tech leaders that really kind of acts as our brain trust um, for our organization to think through the types of events, resources, and programming we should do um, to help our businesses um, leverage and adopt emerging technologies. And so for today, we're talking about how they can partner with startups um, and kind of continue that pipeline of innovation. So without further ado, the Chamber is a member-driven organization. And so I would love to hand it off to one of our members to talk a little bit about the Technology Council. So Jeff Ramo is the head of um, content production owner team at Here Technologies. Um, additionally, he has been our fearless council chair for I think we're going on three years, Jeff. Um, so <laughs> thank you for all that you do for us. Um, and it's my pleasure to just hand it off to you to talk a little bit about um, the tech council and, and why we're here today. Yep, thanks Amelia. Um, yeah, it's been uh, almost two and a half years now since we kicked off the council. Um, and it's a very simple mission mandate for the council, essentially help companies better leverage technology. And we've been doing that uh, via a number of different ways, but there's a couple of key areas. Obviously, education programming is a, a big one. Uh, advocacy um, of our tech community is one. And then the other one, which is arguably maybe the most important, is making connections. And so I love today's event because it checks all those boxes. And, um, and so we look to continue to, to, to do programming that, that builds on, on, on these different facets. Uh, that's about it from me. Thanks, Amelia. Back to you. Thanks, Chef, and thank you for dialing in um, from somewhere warmer, a little bit more tropical. We certainly appreciate that. Um, and just for all your leadership. Um, and as we mentioned today, we're partnering with World Business Chicago and Startup Chicago. I know we have several folks in the audience from Startup Chicago. And so I wanted to bring in, um, and I'm excited to hand it over to Eben Kuriakhaus, who is the EVP um, for Innovation and Venture Strategy at World Business Chicago. Um, I've known Eben for years um, across many different roles in organizations, and he's always been a champion for the tech community and just a wonderful partner to work with. So with that, Eben, can I hand it off to you to just talk a little bit more about um, what you all are working on? Absolutely. Amelia, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and again, um, it's such a great opportunity to work with the Chicago Wind Chamber um, so again, my name is Eben. I lead the Innovation and Mentor Team for World Business Chicago. WBC is the city's economic development organization chaired by the mayor, focused on driving inclusive growth for our city. Um, and my Innovation and Mentor Team leads a portfolio of programs to really drive growth and opportunity uh, for our local tech economy and innovation ecosystem. Um, I want to give a shout out to all our entrepreneurs who participate in our Startup Chicago program. This is WBC's relatively new uh, VC attraction and startup growth program connecting our most promising entrepreneurs with investors and strategic partners. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the chamber because we were talking about how do we better connect our entrepreneurs with um, large businesses here in our city? How do we drive um, our, our, our corporates and large companies to be better invested in, uh, in the startup ecosystem? And this is the perfect opportunity. So thanks again for having us. We're extremely excited for this event and hope to do more of these in the future. Great. Thanks, Evan. And we certainly appreciate your partnership. We know that um, World Business Chicago and the Chamber, we have a lot of overlap in our boards and the business leaders. And so anytime we can partner and work with you all, we certainly um, welcome that. So um, now it is my pleasure actually to kick it off to our moderator for today, um, which is someone else I've known for many years because our paths actually crossed um, in 1871 several years ago. And so um, she's now one of our active members of the Tech Council. Um, so Dr. Lena Sirico is the creator and founding program director of the Masters of Science and Design Thinking and Entrepreneurship Program at National Lewis University. Um, this is a program that's efforts are really focused on how do we further 
um, drive education and women's entrepreneurship and kind of closing that gender gap. Um, Lanessa is an advocate for the business community. I've seen her um, work and mentor you know, everyone from college and high school students all the way up to business leaders. Um, and I'm just really excited for her to be here to um, uh, lead us through today's panel. A quick reminder that we will have time for Q&A at the end of today's panel. So if you go over on the right side of your screen, the event tab has a tab with a chat and a Q&A box. I please ask that you put your questions in there just so we make sure they all come through in one place. Um, and then for the sake of building on connectivity and networking, we do have half an hour after today's panel um, of time for both one-to-one -one networking. And we're also gonna have a kind of networking lounge where Eben and I will be to answer any questions you might have about the Tech Council or Startup Chicago. I um, mean, you can access both of those via the networking and networking lounge buttons on the left side of your screen. Um, and we'll be pinging some instructions uh, towards the end, end of today's panel as well um, for how to access that. So with that, um, Jeff, Eben, and I are gonna hop off stage and Lanessa, I'm gonna hand it to you to invite up the rest of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. I'm just for the record, I'm one of Amelia's biggest cheerleaders. So I will invite our speakers to join us. And as they're joining us, I just want to say again that I'm so happy and excited to be here with everyone um, as we talk about startups and fueling our corporate innovation. So as we know, collaboration is a big key part of innovation. And I think the city of Chicago is a great example of collaboration at work. So it's a perfect topic for us in our community today. So we're waiting for one more panelist. And as we do that, I just want to remind everyone, again, uh, we have time at the end for Q&A. So feel free to enter your Q&A in the event uh, chat and Q&A uh, tabs there uh, to the right-hand side of your screen. So welcome, my panelists. I'm so excited to see all of you and to dive into a really dynamic chat today about innovation. So let's get started. So uh, I'd like to start off by each of you introducing yourself. And then as part of that introduction, if you can just take in a moment to tell us how you define innovation within your organization. So Aaron, you were to the first one on my screen up here. So I'm just going to pass the mic to you first if you can get us started. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Lanessa, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. I think it's a really exciting um, panel and, and discussion topic. So I'm Erin Kirshner. I'm a partner in the corporate group at DLA Piper in our Chicago office. I spend a lot of time um, working with companies of all shapes and sizes on strategic growth, um, usually through, through M&A or through investments in, in other companies. Um, but working with a lot of companies across the, the size and shape spectrum to um, to advance their their growth and innovation strategy. So I'm excited to talk about this um, topic today. I guess as far as how we define innovation within my organization and the law firm industry specifically um, is a little bit different probably than for than for most folks. But I think at the same time really we're all thinking about problem solving, right? So when I think about innovation in uh, within law firms and and within the legal industry, it's being agile and being um, open to new ways of solving you know problems as they arise and trying to create that culture so that people can like people all throughout the the ranks of our organization can bring new ideas to the table and have those um, those ideas you know advanced and developed. Great, thank you, Erin, so much. Uh, ben, I see you next on the top row to my right, so I'm gonna hand it off to you next. And then we can go uh, down to Sheena, and then, yeah. Thanks, Lanessa. Hi, everybody, my name is Ben Shack. I lead digital partnerships for BMO Harris Bank. Um, as far as how we address uh, innovation, or how we define innovation, I mean, we are a 202-year-old bank. Um, so let's just say there's lots of opportunities for us to do things in different ways than they've been done before. So I would say um, we certainly define innovation as, as trying solutions that we haven't tried before, but also delivering solutions and delivering for our customers in ways that we haven't before. Uh, one of those ways is through strategic partnerships, which is my particular area of focus. Uh, so I spend my time thinking about what I will call outside-in innovation and how do we partner with 
maybe non-traditional companies, whether they are fintechs or big techs, uh, whether they are early stage, growth stage, or later. Um, but how do we think about working with other companies to drive innovative solutions for our customers and, and help us deliver on our strategic challenges? And uh, I'm excited to talk lots more about it. Shane, I think over to you. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. My name is Shana Atkins. I'm the founder of Atco. We are an agile um, product management and design firm. And um, I also have a passion project that I'm la launching called Expand HR. And I've just recently graduated from BMO's um, Women in Fintech program with 1871. In terms of how um, my organization defines innovation. It's all about creating an environment where we can test, learn, and scale ideas. Um, and that's really kind of just the passion of mine is what are the circumstances from a work ways of working perspective to create an environment for teams to thrive in that way. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me okay? Beautiful. I I just got my vaccine and felt like everything feels a little different. Um, so hi, I'm Yao from Here Technologies. We're a map company of making maps of the world. And I usually introduce myself as the dreamer of the company. We're really looking at the new maps, the airspace maps, robots, undergrounds, um, you name it. And I think for us um, and for me personally, innovation is definitely number one. Can we keep building competitive advantage for the company? So keep getting that special sauce, feeding into it. Um, I think that's really the only way to stay ahead because whatever you're good at, someone else will find a way to do it better and cheaper. And then the second piece for me is really, can we solve some real human problems. I always joke that I don't care about ad tech. We can we can sell more advertisement to people, but can we can we solve problems that really create long lasting impacts on people's lives? And I think money and the rest will follow, especially if we're able to tackle new markets where people haven't been served in a in a um, in a convenient and value added way. So I think um, it really boils down to, can we do something that only we know how to do really well at the moment, keep pushing the envelope. And secondly, is what we're doing really solving real pain and bringing something that people really benefit from. I think that grounds our innovation work. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. I love the words that you guys were using to describe innovation in your introduction because I think defining it is really important when we start off the conversation. So I love this commonality that you guys all shared with curiosity, collaborating environments, and really this curiosity to seek out opportunities and solving problems. So I love it. So um, I'm super excited to dive in. So with that, that sets the stage for our second question uh, that I have for you today. So in your opinion, what do you think drives innovation strategy within companies? And what do you think should be driving it? So just to create an easy flow here, I think we'll start off maybe in the same pattern. Why don't we go Aaron, Ben, Shana, yeah, just the same pattern throughout our conversation. Yeah, yeah happy to do that. So, so I would say, I guess for, from the outsider's perspective, I mean, I see, um, I see companies, like I said, from kind of all walks of life. Um, so for, for me, when I hear clients articulate what's driving innovation, you know, at their organizations or, you know, why they might be taking a of this strategic path versus the other one, it can be driven by a lot of different things, honestly. And so, I, you know, I sometimes see people be reactive in terms of competition, you know, my major competitor just bought a similar kind of company. And so now we know that they're going to be out there, you know, innovating in this area, or this is a new product line for them. And how can I catch up? But, you know, better would be to be the, the competitor in the first place to who's had the idea to go and make the first move on that, right? So, you know, if you can get people who are thinking proactively, kind of to what Yao said in terms of, you know, how do we stay ahead of the competition? Where Where is this industry going? Um, and how can we sort of s figure out what the pain points are that we can then innovate around solving those problems and serving them? So I think that's from the outsider's perspective, that's how I think about it. I think law firms that, uh, ourselves, you know, within my own organization, I think it uh, it, it is often 
it does often tend to be driven by, you know, what are the competitors doing and, and what are our clients doing? What, you know, when clients start focusing more on, you know, when fintech became a thing, like, okay, now we need to adapt and, you know, get expertise in this area. And, you know, how can we build, uh, build our, our, you know, bench of people who have those um, areas of expertise and, and service that niche. So I think it's kind of customer driven um, within law firms anyway. Yeah, I would, I would echo a lot of that. I do think there can be a lot of drivers. I think the question is partly about what should be driving it. And one way to answer it is to talk about what shouldn't be driving it. So I, uh, one approach that I have seen um, is to, you know, create some sort of a capital I innovation team who then focuses on going out and finding a problem to solve through some sort of um, purportedly innovative means. And I've seen that approach multiple times. And, and I would say that seems to work not so well. Um, the, the better approach seems to be, or what I would advocate for at least, would be um, using the strategic goals of the organization as the framing. And, and this is a point I'll probably come back to later in our conversation as well. But using the strategic goals of the organization, whether that is hedging against disruptive threats, which is part of what Aaron was talking about, or whether it is serving your customers better or whether it is a need to compete differently or change the economics of your business. But focus on those strategic challenges and then try to create conditions that allow for more innovative solutions to those problems to thrive and take root in the organization. So those things could be um, you know, top-down leadership support for more innovative solutions. Those things could be evaluating your various control points and assess solution assessment mechanisms uh, and governing bodies within the organization and make sure that there's a way for innovative solutions to come through and that it doesn't always go back to the tried and true. Uh, or it could be setting up you know, some small centers of competency within the organization that allow you to kind of have eyes on the outside world, like the partnerships team that I'm part of, um, or that uh, focus on more innovative ways of delivering, whether that's uh, an agile center of competency or a design thinking center of competency, uh, but kind of having those tools within the organization so that way, when it's time to solve a big problem through something innovative, you do have some expertise and some tools that will allow that to happen. Uh, so that would be one approach that I might advocate for. Shana, your turn. Yeah, I mean, everyone has given such great answers. I think I will kind of add on to the conversation. Um, so what, I often see is kind of similar to what Ben talked about is you have these innovation groups within an organization, they build really cool um, solutions and then they sort of do these road shows where they show them around, but the scalability, the testability, like the real, the to infiltrate it into the market of based on how that organization um, goes to market, that, that translation doesn't always happen. And what I, what I like would like to see or what I do see that has been successful is having transparent mechanisms um, from the bottom up and the top down. So as well as like, in, you know, external in so that the organization kind of under like has various outputs that drive their strategic goals. And there's a, always a mechanism for communicating um, what the opportunities are. I often find like some of the most missed opportunities are ideas or uh, that come from the workforce itself. Like you, if you see a good business analyst in an organization or a really good developer, they're in this every single day trying to figure out how to better serve the customer. But there's always there's not always a mechanism for them to communicate like, oh, should we go in this direction? Like, what's that feedback loop? So that's um, that's what I would say. Yeah, Shana, I would totally echo that. I think that is a spot on because you, you often find that the people who are on the ground who have the closest connection to the client or the customer yeah. Are those that are those that really understand what the pain points are, what the difficulty with selling the product is, you know, they're the ones that are in the weeds. And if you haven't created that culture of, you know, having those people understand that their ideas are valued and that there's an opportunity to bring those ideas, you know, to whether it's the product innovation team or wh whoever it is within the organization, 
kind of help help that filter throughout you, you know that you're just never gonna you're never gonna get the results of that like really good on the ground um intelligence yeah, absolutely i think the big eye for innovation is important but it's like also the little eye for individual and like how do you hear those people that's a beautiful way to put it, Shana. I agree. I a key thing that I pulled away from what everything everybody shared was the innovation is very holistic. It's not just one team or Aaron, you had mentioned before one decision. It isn't purchasing innovation to match our business model, our business strategy. It's a holistic process from top down and bottom up that we need to focus on, which is another conversation hopefully in the future. So I know if Amelia is listening, I think another great to talk is then you mentioned like uh, tools and frameworks that kind of help support that. There's lots of tools and frameworks that can support uh, a culture of innovation that also supports Shana's uh, comment about the individual and focusing on them. Uh, so I love that. The last thing I want to share that key takeaway for me was um, a comment about being reactive. Erin, you mentioned being, uh, you, you've personally experienced businesses being reactive versus proactive. And that makes me think of two companies that are chasing the market or chasing innovation instead of being proactive and not really acknowledging the, uh, the cons in that approach to doing that. So beautiful. Oh, any other? Sorry, I thought somebody was going to comment. Um, okay, so next question. So this is going to be a two-part question for all of us. And I think Yao yeah, is just having some connection issues. So hopefully she can uh, join us uh, for the rest of the chat. So let's talk more about the different ways that companies can approach innovation. I, I heard you guys all mention a little bit about that. So this is a two-part question. So what are the benefits and drawbacks to some of these different approaches to innovation? And then what are you seeing working either within your organizations or those that you're working with? Uh, Aaron, we can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I see a bunch of different approaches, but most often people come to me when they're trying to do something externally, right? You know, that they need the legal support for the, for, you know, kind of an inorganic growth strategy. So, um, you know, I see it in, I see it in a couple different ways. You can go down the just pure acquisition kind of path, like that, you know, there's a company out here with a great product or a great team or, you know, do whatever the situation might be. Um, that we just wanna we want to acquire that company so we can take advantage of their knowledge. Or you might be going like the corporate venture capital kind of um, route where, okay, maybe we're gonna take an investment in this company. and you know maybe we start off with a smaller investment. and you know maybe there's a commercial partnership that goes along with that. And we kind of build the rapport and the relationship and connectivity between the our two organizations, and we see what we can take. Um, take away from that and you know maybe that ultimately leads to a more um, full-scale acquisition or maybe it doesn't but it you know establishes this commercial partnership between um, between the teams and then there's also just the pure commercial partnership route which I'm sure Ben can speak to you know more specifically in terms of um, in terms of you know just having a, a, a strategic partnership with an organization and you know whatever the, that might look like um, so, you know, I think there are, like you said, there are benefits and drawbacks to all of those. I think the most challenging of those to be effective, as we've kind of already managed, uh, mentioned, is the pure acquisition. And let me be clear, this happens all the time. So th some of these are very successful, but I think we've all seen um, acquisitions where the integration post-acquisition just like it doesn't gel and you're not able to really take the best things about that company that you you know wanted to hire that team that you wanted to hire and translate that more broadly into the rest of your organization so i think there just needs to be a lot of thought given in the planning stages of this of the process and the companies that i work with that i think are most successful at doing this really have a robust vetting process in terms of due diligence where they really think strategically about what am I trying to get out of this? And, you know, what is my ultimate goal in this acquisition? And, you know, when I bring this company into my organization, how am I going to take those parts of it that are, that are obviously we believe will be accretive and, you know, move that more broadly within my organization and make sure that they're, that they're really gelling with the culture of my institution, which hopefully that culture is already strong and you can, and you know you want to make sure that you're not damaging that culture and you know bringing the outside people in. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of different aspects to that. That could be a whole conversation in and of itself. But um, 
but you know, culture and personality, I think are really important in terms of, of the integration. So I have Ben, if you wanna um, add anything to that. Yeah, I, I think that your points are spot on for acquisition situations, and they actually apply almost equally to good partnership discussions as well. And, and I'll kind of focus a little bit on the partnership angle because that's my space. Um, when it comes to uh, whether it is corporate to corporate partnership or corporate to startup partnership, um, I think that two things you said there really, really resonate if you want things to work. One is making sure that you're clear on your goals and on the goals for the startup or the partner as well and making sure that everybody's able to understand what it is that you're in this for and what's important and what's not important to each of the parties um, because that's going to give you the best opportunity to structure a partnership that works well for everybody and of course help you not spend time um, haggling over things that don't actually matter to anybody uh, so i think that's important and then culture fit as well um, that's one of the things that I think can make partnerships work easier and get um, other stakeholders within a, within the corporate side to buy into a partnership is when there's <laughs> excuse me um, when there's a really good culture match uh, and when there's good values alignment. So, uh, for example, we actually announced a new partnership just yesterday with a seed stage startup, probably earlier than a company that we have partnered with before. And um, one of the reasons that we're excited about it in Vimo and that we got it over the hump is because we're super, super aligned on values and mission and purpose. Uh, and that helps to, helps to overcome a lot of challenges um, with the regular concerns that, that people might have with, um, with partnering in a more innovative way and with an earlier stage company. Um, last thing that I'll add in addition to the culture match and the, and the understanding value is um, really just making sure that if you are going to go down the partnership road to try to drive more innovation, being really purposeful about where you want to try to use that um, and keep yourself out of the space of having a cool partner that you're trying to find the right fit for by walking them all around the organization. Um, I, I will be the first to tell you that a, a corporate will get tired real quick of uh, the, hey, I found a cool startup conversation. Um, it, it has to be a situation where there's kind of a pull for that innovation or that innovative partnership me uh, mechanism, as opposed to somebody trying to push it within the organization. Uh, so that's kind of the last thing I would add there. Shane, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, so I, um, thinking about this question, I struggled with what angle to come from, but I think that the best thing I can do is actually talk about it from the perspective of a startup, right? And so, um, I almost want to say when you're a startup and you are passionate and on fire about the innovation that you can bring to an organization, and I would say if you're more early stage, not so much ready for acquisition, but you're looking for a partnership opportunity or to get go after some corporate venture investment or something like that, I think preparation is key. And also having a really robust understanding of how over time your roadmap for what you're building is going to continue to be innovative. Um, and also like have an understanding and really like take the time to learn whoever your target organizations are, target companies that you want to work with, what their culture is, right? And like, what are some of the barriers to entry that you may face in trying to partner with the organization, trying to go after that investment um, and start to build relationships now and enjoy, like take the slow and steady and bite-sized route. That would be, um, that would be my advice because you can have a really great opportunity in front of you and you're just not ready or the, you know, your one innovative step in your backlog away from being exactly where they need to be. And that is okay. Not every partnership or not every um, investor is for your company or is for you. And it may like, building that relationship and having a ongoing communication so that people can always follow you, I think is absolutely critical. And also like getting champions and mentors along the way because people people do watch and they do 
kind of the watching progress, they're able to understand when they fit in and when it's the right time. So I know I went on for a little bit there, but <laughs> I get passionate about these topics. So, yeah. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, I'm glad to see with us. I can repeat the question for you. I'm not sure if you were able to jump in when we when I announced the question, but we're talking about the different ways companies can approach innovation. So is a two part question. What are the benefits and drawbacks to these approaches? And then what are you seeing working either within your own organization or those that you're working with? Definitely. Yeah. I've been I've been working a while. So it's really lovely to listen to the conversation. Um, and I think we're, we've been in both situations. So as an innovation team for a medium-sized company, we've definitely talked with startups to try to explore partnerships. But we've also talked to mega companies. So we're more like the startup company that's trying to leverage their scale, their reach into the market, um, especially if it's a new market that we're working with. And I think I wrote down three different things. Um, so number one is, are we shooting for the same moon? I think innovation is definitely aspirational, goes back to what um, Ben was saying earlier, what's your mission and purpose? But I think for us, a very concrete way is do we have the same end goal? If this thing were to be mega successful, what does that look like? Um, I think part of that is, do you have a good executive sponsorship that can see you through the long term and you know it's there for the, for the long haul? So that's number one, are you shooting for the same moon? The second one is really comes down to where the rubber hits the road a little bit. What is your execution plan? So I think going back to culture, but more concretely, do you have the same agility? Are you moving at the same pace? What's your timeline? What's your tolerance for risk? What are different milestones that you can agree on? I think all that communication becomes so important. So you're really, as you build your way towards the moon, what are the little stars you want to pick up along the way as your roadmap and progressing towards that? I think that keeps both sides honest and it's a good conversation when you don't hit those milestones. The last thing, so we have the, are you shooting for the same moon? Do you have the same expectations? And then finally, what are the foundations? I think that's something that people come back and say, oops, later on and becomes a big problem, even down to do you have sourcing engaged? Do you have licensing? Really, like innovation feels sexy, but it's a very cross-functional work. And there is so much grunge work that you need, to, you need to flush out. And then in terms of, um, we do software development. So are you even on the same platform? Do you have the same standards? So I think some of that foundation really needs to be worked out so you don't get to that crossroad and realize um, there's a lot of work that needs to be redone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love hearing each of your stories and your feedback. And I think, uh, Yao, your comments made me think of what Aaron had mentioned earlier about uh, there's always different ways to approach innovation, right? We know that, but it's being very intentional and in recognizing what that path is for your organization, whether it's a fast path, a disruptive path, or maybe a slower path, depending on what the organization wants to do. But being very intentional was the other word that came to mind. Ben had used purposeful, which is another great word. Intentionality comes to mind in all this is being very intentional with those partnerships are what, what you're doing. Um, and I love, uh, Shana, your comment about not everyone's a great fit, right? It's kind of like dating. Not everyone that you're going to go on a date with is going to be the right fit for you. So it's the exact same thing with all this partnership development, really making sure you're taking the time to get to know one another. And slowing down in the process, I think, is another key takeaway I got from this. So it's all beautiful. So thank you so much. We're moving on to our next two-part question. Two-part questions seem to be a theme here. Uh, so numerous surveys show that companies face the most challenges when building the innovation culture internally. So can you share more about what you all have done to create a culture of innovation with your own organizations? And then what has been the biggest challenge for you? Yeah. So. Um I'm excited to talk about this question. I think this goes to sort of the culture point that a lot of us have been making um, earlier. And I happen to have, these are not original thoughts. I happen to have just read a really interesting article on Harvard Business Review that talked about the neuroscience of trust. And I was just fascinated by because it was like actual scientific support for all of these things that I already thought. Um, so, I mean, I guess maybe that's an echo chamber effect <laughs> a little bit, but in any event, I'll take what I'll take it uh, as support for my own theories um, or my own, I guess, lived experience in terms of, of um, working within organizations as I've grown in my own career. And I think, you know, what that what I would really focus on. Thanks. Yeah, I see you just put the link in there. It's such a great article. I really recommend it. Um, but what I would just emphasize is 
is culturally innovation doesn't happen within an organization unless people trust that they're that they're free to throw ideas out there and that they won't be criticized for that. In fact, that that will be welcomed and that it will make a difference. I mean, not all ideas are good ideas, right? I mean, but you know, the idea is that you're creating the environment within your organization that you can bring an idea to the table and hash it out and maybe it has merit and it'll get worked on and developed and maybe it has no merit and you know, we'll, we'll move on, but that you'll not be penalized for coming with some crazy ideas. Um, and that, you know, if you're a lower level person within the organization and, you know, you maybe have an insight because maybe you just had a great conversation with a customer or a client that identified an issue and you're like, wait, we could be doing this so differently or here's how we could improve the user interface for our product or, you know, how we could better address whatever the problem is. But you don't have any connectivity to the people who would actually make that happen and you don't feel valued within the organization to where you think that you, you're um, contribution from that uh, place would be uh, meaningful or would have any impact, um, then, then that that is a, a great idea that's just died and you haven't, your organization hasn't been um, able to take advantage of that. So I think, I think trust is really the foundation of, um, of a culture of innovation. And then I think, you know, along with that, then that also breeds loyalty and, you know, just ha happiness within the organization, and within your workforce, which is, you know, kind of what we're all striving for um, in our, in each of our own organizations. I'm sure I can say that without um, <laughs> consulting the rest of the panelists. So, I, you know, for me, I, I think that's the, that's probably the number one thing that I would see, would say as far as um, trying to create a, a culture of innovation. And certainly that's what I try to um, emphasize when I'm working with my own team and, um, and, uh, firm. I like that. I, um, I'm going to share two ideas and they're connected. Uh, and the first one will seem uh, perhaps wildly inappropriate for this particular forum, given the, um, given the title of it. Uh, and Shana will probably roll her eyes because I think she's heard me say this before, but so, so keep in mind, like I said earlier, I work at a 200 and some odd year old bank um, who has been around for 200 and some odd years because we're really good at managing risk. Uh, and so I work in sort of an extreme environment of innovation being challenged. And so for me, the first rule of innovation is don't talk about innovation. Um, and the second rule, like, you know what the second rule is. Uh, so, and, and what I mean is, you know, for me to drive innovation, uh, innovative solutions, what I talk internally about with, with my colleagues and business leaders is driving new revenue growth, driving down expenses, maybe improving customer experience, especially if it's improving customer experience in a way where we can actually measure the customer retention or the additional cross-sell benefit that comes from it. Um, Maybe it's about risk mitigation, if you think about um, innovative solutions that might be in that area. So I talk to business leaders and decision makers and the language that they understand and about the things that really matter to them. And then sometime later, when we've done whatever the thing is that we're going to do, I might casually mention that what we've done is actually quite innovative uh, and start to sort of build the um, build the trust back to Aaron's word in, in that process. Um, and that brings me to the second, the second idea, which is uh, when I think when it comes to, to trying to practice innovation, it's definitely a case where success breeds more success. Um, and so, you know, maybe uh, I do have to use, you know, my stealth innovation approach for uh, one or two partnerships. But then later when you can start to say, oh, hey, you know what, yeah, what what I'm talking about, this new partnership or this new approach, it feels maybe it feels different from what we've done before, but it's actually just like this, right? It's like it's like the this of this new area um, and connect it back to what people understand as being successful, give them a frame of reference that takes some of the fear factor out of doing things that are innovative or new. Um, and and that's an approach that i've uh, that I've seen work well when it comes to building that culture of innovation. Like sometimes it's not so much talking about innovation, it's talking about business results um, and and driving more openness to doing things, maybe in a way that seems different from how they've done it before. Mm. 
Yeah, so I think that's awesome. And I definitely um, can relate to if you want to talk about innovation, don't use the word innovation. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach in that uh, when I think about innovation, a lot of times, especially just because of my background, there's a lot of talk about agility. And then there's a parallel between agility and speed. And then the thought process is that with agility, you get speed and then you get innovation because you're going really fast. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of innovation in space, like giving humans the space as knowledge workers to create um, and have those uh, thought bubble moments of this can work and how do I pursue it and what is the best way to go after it. And so um, one trick that I use is that I try to set all my minutes for my meetings for like 25 minutes or 50 minutes so that like there's just a, a bubble of time where I can absorb before I go to the next thing. So that's a very random comment, but I think it just makes the world of difference. And then the second thing I, I ideal I'll bring to the forefront is the sunk cost fallacy. So sometimes you're like going full speed ahead with an innovative, like maybe it's you're, you know, going after an acquisition or, um, going after a particular partnership or deal, and you realize that it's not necessarily the right thing at some point, but because time, money, and resources have been invested, there's no like breaking point. It's like, oh, we're just gonna keep going. It's, it's okay to pivot and walk away and do something different because I think that those little points of pivots are really what defines an amazing company, right? Uh, BMO Bank has not been the same bank for the last 200 years, right? So at some points, there's little changes that are made that make it what it is today. And I think that that is something that, you know, we have to embrace is that space and it's okay to, you know, pivot. I love that. And I'm so mad. My my third talking point is gone. But uh, I'll pick you back on that just very slightly. I think really it's like a relationship. It doesn't matter if you moved in, your your finances are merged. Just move on. You know, it's not working. And you can now just keep investing more into it, um, especially when resources are tied up and people don't feel good at the end of the day when it's not the right thing to do. So. That's what I'll say on that. Um, the other two things I wanted to mention, a little bit holding space for people too. So we hold social events such as chai time, we do lunch hours, but really have a space for people really come in and talk about something. And sometimes there will be organic conversations. So did you hear about that trend? You know, let's talk about the rockets. It could be anything that really flow in the conversation. I think that generally helps us connect the dots, kind of get a pause of what people are thinking. We even thought about starting office hours, just really give people that space to come in and ask anything. So that's number two, I think really creating that space for ourselves to think, but also hold that space for people who not, might be doing something that's more routine day in and day out. And then the last one that, um, I really enjoy is we host an ambassador program. So people from different organizations come on as an assignment basis and they will work on a very concrete project with us for a while. So part exposure, part career development, and part just to be honest, we always need more people. So it's good to get some hands on deck too. I felt like that's worked really well, just short bursts of very concrete, well-defined projects for people to really get a taste of innovation. Yeah, I love that. I think uh, my word that I keep coming up and that comes to mind when you share what you did is curiosity, that you were so curious and you're, you're being very intentional in creating that space. Uh, you mentioned space, which also makes me think about what research tells us about the physical space and how important the physical environment is literally connected and correlated with the innovations and creativity. So we, we talked previously about, right, we mentioned holistic nature of innovation. So that ties in with that, I love it. Uh, the last comment I'll say here before we uh, move to our final question, is um, another key takeaway from Ben, Aaron, and Shana. Uh, ben, your comments really hit home for me when you shared that your rule about don't talking about innovation. So that made me think of a question that I intentionally ask companies that I work with when that comes up, which is what is the risk that we're taking if we don't do this? So it's trying to 
create a conversation with these individuals that might be resistant to, okay, well now let's talk about what happens if we don't do this. To so bring the forefront of the table, that conversation of the larger risk of not talking about innovation and changing that role. So that was all great to hear. So my panelists, we've reached the end to our final question. Thank you. And uh, my listeners, uh, again, please enter your questions in the event tab there if you have any questions for our panelists. But our final question uh, for you is, again, you know the trend, a two-part question. So what is one piece of advice or guidance you would give to the startups here today who are looking to partner with a large corporate company? And then similarly, what is some advice you can give to the corporates looking to work more with startups? So Aaron, we'll start with you. I feel like I get the advantage here because it's like you're the first one to give their thoughts. So I feel bad for Shana and Yao, especially. Or you just put on the spot. You just put on the spot right away. Yeah. All right. Well, so what I, I, I would have a lot of different pieces of advice, frankly, for in both of these situations. But I actually think the one thing, and it's been mentioned here by a number of people, so I'll be the one to say this first. Um, is to keep the to keep the end goal in mind at all times, and to not lose sight of that. Um, exactly to the point about sunk costs and you know moving on that both Shane and Yao made the keeping in mind what you ultimately want to get out of this partnership. So if you are a corporate and you are looking for an acquisition or an investment in this company or a strategic partnership with this smaller company you know, really what is, okay, we're trying to get this technology because we've got this idea for how we can integrate this and we can be, you know, um, have some more like um, uh, vertical, you know, vertically aligned product, what, whatever it is. But okay, now that we've got into due diligence, maybe we can see that the product isn't as strong as what we thought it was. Maybe there's other things out there in the market. It's not as protectable. It's like, ultimately, there's not as much that's innovative about it as we originally thought. Having the strength to admit like, okay, we've gone down this path and we've spent a fair amount of money and time going down this path, but actually this isn't gonna be the right thing for us. Or actually, the more we talk to this team of people, the more we don't think that they gel with, you know, our organization and our culture and our goals. Um, and I think that that's on both sides of the equation. Then if you're a startup and you're, you know, looking at an acquisition or being acquired by someone, or you're looking at it, taking an investment from someone and they're going to sit on your board, you better make sure that the, the partnership feels good from like a personal culture fit perspective and that you keep your end goal in mind. Is it, I just want an exit because I want to, do something new. I've got new ideas in a totally different space and I, I you know, I'm going to stay on for six to 12 months in sort of a transition role and then I'm going to go and take my earnings and I'm going to do something else with that. Or is it, you know, actually I really want to be a part of this bigger organization and this is more of a, you know, melding of minds here and I think it's exciting what we can do together and I want to see this through long term. Well, there are very different the way that your agreements, the way that you would structure that would be very different depending on the, you know, the outcome that you're seeking. And frankly, the two sides can get pretty far down the path before realizing that that the goals are not aligned, right? Like, the, you know, the way they may see you as sort of a temporary, you know, person in this position and, you know, they're planning to just kind of take your product and fold it in and then move on. Whereas that's not at all how you saw it. So I think just keeping the end goal in mind and not being afraid to um, walk away from things that, you know, ultimately don't uh, seem aligned is probably the number one advice that I would that I would give. I like all of that. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to break Linus's rule and I'm going to answer the two part question in one part. Because uh, I think my advice for corporates who want to work with startups and startups who want to work with corporates would be the same. Um, I talked earlier about you know focusing on on the actual business goal um, and talked earlier about sort of values and purpose alignment, which I think those things are important. Two more things I would add that we haven't talked about yet. Um, one would be just start with the assumption that um, if if a corporate can buy something from a tried and true standard vendor, uh, they're probably going to, the the default is going to be to do that, right? Because 
that's why it's tried and true and um, corporates are generally not risk-seeking, risk-loving entities. Um, so if you want to work with more uh, startups, I would say focus on kind of white space use cases. So focus on the things that you can't do with um, technology vendor A, B, or C uh, because that product doesn't exist or because um, there's some other element. So, you know, an example might just be around uh, you can't buy it from from your standard vendor because uh, because the startups are the only ones who have the newest and most innovative technology. It could also be though that um, you want to do something that's not so much we want to buy from this vendor. You know, so think more about distribution partnerships. Think more about what your assets as a corporation are and what a startup's assets are and where there might be complementary things that you can do together that are different than the things that you could potentially do with a more traditional vendor instead. So like focus on the things that you can't do with somebody else because then uh, you don't have to fight with every um, with every kind of corporate support area you might have about why you're not using such and such approved vendor. Um, because it's not actually a choice for what you want to do. So that's that's one idea. Um, and the second idea I would share would be, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment. Um, make it easy to try. So I think the other idea would be um, realize that partnering with a startup is going to be seen as a risky endeavor. Realize that at some point, all of your approval processes, due diligence, um, vendor assessment, those things are all going to kick in at some point. Um, so one way to deal with that is to find really low risk ways to try. Uh, and so if you are the startup, you know, think about, a, a, even if it's a low fidelity version, but think about an easy to try version that doesn't require, you know, passing PII back and forth and deep technology integration. Think about, um, you know, services and use cases that uh, if there is some kind of an interruption, it's not going to break the corporate. Um, because that way, if you can kind of get yourself in a, in a low risk uh, way to get started, you can build more commitment, you can build more relationships and buy yourself time to get ready for all the hard things that are ahead. Uh, so think about low risk ways to try would be the other thought I would share. Uh, and that goes for both sides. Jane? Yes. Yeah, so, um... I would say that in terms of corporates that want to work more with startups, I'd say that um, being a champion for that startup and just kind of sharing what they need to know. I think everything been said about vendor assessments and just like all of the there's a lot that happens in the procurement process that I believe takes most startups by surprise when they do partner with corporates. And just as much information as you can share as a champion who is in direct communication with startups, I think the better. And then even from a legal perspective, Aaron, I think that's another area where it's like asking those questions about what is your goal? What is, you know, so that that translate into the spirit of the deal, right? So. I think from a startup perspective, um, what uh, like bubbles up for me is, and I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, is it's in like my piece of advice would be um, to enjoy the journey and build relationships along the way um, because it is a uh it is a it's a ride and i think anyone who's been a founder through the pandemic has learned that and just continue consi be consistent about what your goal is and continue to communicate what your goal is so i think that would be my um advice from the startup perspective and i will take the question from q a as well folding into my answer um and again, I'm constantly writing things down. I felt like the minute I look up, I'll lose my train of thought here. Um, I think really uh, for us, it's being flexible. So you might walk in thinking someone will be a good partner, someone might be a good investor, but at the end of the day, maybe they're better fit for, I think Julian from Q&A mentioned it as advisor. And um, Shana, I love the word champion. It's maybe it's someone who can give you really good feedback on your 
processes on their processes um, on your strategy your product or maybe just go to market we know really well about this region this channel and this is all i can help you with be flexible with that so i think answering julian's question is um it's a little bit like um a serious relationship you might start with hey can we can we do something maybe it's a friendship really it's a it's a back and forth and at some point they might not have what you're looking for to give you vice versa so i think really um they could fit anywhere from your beta tester maybe they'll just take your finished product not necessarily work on it with you but give you some early feedback um going back to aaron's trust um if you feel like that's someone who you can trust um, with some of the glitchier product, but you know it's not really someone that you could be in development with or invest money in you. Figure out something that might work for the relationship still. Um, yeah, I think I felt like I'm I'm going all over the place, but really comes back to be flexible. It's a two way street. Figure out what you can give each other, and the same company might fit in different roles along your journey. Yeah, I love that because I think that goes back to the notes that I've been taking from what you've been sharing is a uh, two way and relationships. It's all about communication, which I keep hearing a theme too. And communication is two way, just like it's not top down, it's top down and bottom up. So yeah, I think that's my key takeaway from you is that it is two way and we have to be very intentional in building those relationships. Um, the other key takeaway I have is uh, Ben, you had mentioned earlier, just design thinking in general. And I thought about that when Aaron had mentioned um, listening uh, to these relationships, listening to the board, listening to the people, because that's part of design thinking is listening with our eyes and listening to behavior and data. And that comes not only listening to our consumers, but listening to our employees, listening to what's going on in the organization. And part of the importance of that, of innovation is listening, taking in that data and reacting and pivoting like everything you guys have just shared. So the key takeaway for me there is listening and, re and reacting and pivoting and, and knowing that that's part of this innovation process um, to move forward. So I love uh, everything that you shared. I appreciate your time, everyone. Um, we have two questions from our listeners that we're gonna dive into. We may go just a one or two minutes over here, but I wanna make sure we hit both questions. So Yao, you did a great job of noticing Julian's question. So we're gonna start with Julian's question. Uh, Julian, thanks for asking your question. So uh, Julian wants to know, aside from going the route of procuring an investor, so an investor for innovation, I think Julian is your procurer. What would it look like to seek the route of an advisor instead for an innovation uh, project? Um, I don't know if I'm, well, we can take the route either um, as maybe, Julian, I think maybe you wanna, your, your question is getting to seeking an advisor from an innovation idea, maybe internally or externally. Uh, I guess our panel can take either approach. What would be some advice for seeking an advisor um, for an innovation project? Hi, kids. So I say I have two points of advice. One is um, I would connect with like the local startup con community in your city. So for instance, 1871 in Chicago has a mentor hours program, which basically it's, you know, people who are industry experts come in and, you know, volunteer their time. And I, I literally just go out and ask. I, I'm really big on demo. So like be able to demonstrate where you are so far, what your clear questions are. And you'd be surprised like what, who emails who to get you connected. Um, and then if you're like unable to do that through a more structured community, what um, I am a big fan of going on LinkedIn and being like, hey community i need x and you'd be very surprised like anyone who likes to engage with the connection sees it so um you, you'd be very surprised about how much traction you can get there so that's definitely i uh, think the other thing that i was going to mention is that Issa ray who is um, you know, she writes TV shows. She talks about it's not just about networking up, it's about networking across. Like, be tell your peers what you need too, because they're also having conversations with corporates, investors, etc. And so, if something I, I've, I found a lot that something may not be a good fit for me, I know someone else who is a good fit. So, um, that's I think a good thing as well is to just tell your peers.
Yeah, I love that, Sheena. I think that's so true. We try to do that with within uh, you know our own organization in terms of kind of creating networking spaces, creating like peer to peer networks for people who might uh, you know our clients who are sort of similarly situated and you know might benefit from just getting to know each other in the ecosystem. I think there are so many opportunities to do that. That makes a ton of sense. One other thing I was going to add is you know if you are in the place of starting up a company in your very early stage and you're not yet ready to take on an investor. And, and if that's what the question really is more focused on, like how do I get some advisors in that space? I think Shana's advice is great. The other thing that you could consider is, you know, as you're building your board, some of those people might not be directors, but you know, you might consider, excuse me, investors, but you might be considering just taking on some like industry expert or somebody with, you know, a lot of experience building a company in sort of a similar or parallel space um, that, you know, you might be able to. And that might be the thing that you're able to then offer them as uh, going to Yao's point in terms of making sure that there's like mutual benefit there. Because a lot of people, they, you know, they do like to um, sit on boards and obviously that's great um, connectivity for them, their networks and building their resumes but you know a really good board at a company from a governance perspective is there to be a sounding a sounding board for um the executives and to to really serve that kind of advisory role um so that's something to think about uh often comes with investment later on but if you're really early stages you know it, it can definitely be uh separate from that the only thing I want to add is start with a very specific question in the request, because if you're putting out, this is me, this is my company, it might be hard for someone to tackle exactly how they can help you. So I think working your way up, and also it's a way for you to assess them. If they're able to answer your questions very clearly or say, I don't know, but this is how I think I can help you, then you can build up that relationship incrementally and becomes a general purpose advisor for you later on. That's great. Well, I know we have one more question from Lauren. Lauren, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share your uh, statement with the panelists and we can, uh, just because we're at time, I really want to make sure we address your comments. So Lauren, I'll make sure that we uh, contact you after uh, this session and share some comments from the panelists. Okay. I appreciate you uh, entering in your comments here today. So uh, I want to thank everyone here for your time, for your insights. I am just applauding all your efforts. It's so great to learn more about each of you. Um, my key takeaway from everything that you shared today is really for me, it's pointing the way towards intentionality and creating cultures of innovation. And I think if we've experienced anything in this past year, we've experienced that this is absolutely something that every single company should be focused on uh, without a doubt moving forward into our new world, whatever it may look like. So with that, I'm going to toss it back to uh, Amelia, who will close our event out. So thank you, everyone, for being here. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of our speakers. I want to thank um, Lanessa and Yao and Ben and Shana and Aaron for joining us. Um, you know, the chamber itself is like 100 and. I think 17 or 18 year old organization. So not quite looks as like it'll though. be one moment. Looks like we're having just a minor connection issue and Amelia will get us right. Hi, hopefully um, uh, to and Ben and Yao and Trina and Aaron for joining us today. Um, I personally got a lot out of the session, a lot to think about um, in terms of innovation, how we can build more connectivity within our community. Um, to that end, the activity piece, I wanted to point out two opportunities um, that we have kind of following this session um, for those who want to stick around and connect one on one. Um, we do have the networking. So if you go to the left side of your screen, um, you'll see it's two hands shaking. You might remember that there was a time when we were allowed to shake hands. So that was in the back. Um, so you can go there if it's networking, or it will match you um, randomly with another attendee, and you'll have about three minutes. Um, to connect and to actually exchange information within that platform as well. So you have the opportunity to go and jump into that until 1.30. Um, or if you would like to join myself and Evan in our networking round, um, you can enter in there as well, ask any questions about the platform, about the platform, about the platform, about the startup, the business in general. Um, you can enter in the answering partners, so you all have to get the request um, to share audio and video so that we can see you. 
So again, thank you all for coming to our council. I thought you made a couple of other questions. And in fact, we did I appreciate that as well. Thank you for starting to join us today. Um, and of course, we had our head of events for the chamber who is our coffee expert for today. So um, with that, thank you everyone for joining us for the next opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank you.